have you with us today. We see this as an opportunity for us to really create a learning community who advocate for the use of Agile across an enterprise. And we're so glad to have such a variety of people and such great practitioners join us for this uh, momentous event. And we have a series of these planned throughout the year. We look forward to you joining us at all of them, perhaps even being a speaker at one in the future. We really look forward to having you there. The whole idea of this is to be open source, kind of sharing of information and ideas and uh, learning as we go. Uh, as you can tell by the uh, registration date today, it was learning as we go on that respect. <laughs> we also have a, a double uh, use of this information. Wayne and I have the, the honor of teaching uh, an agile leadership course for the University of Pennsylvania in the organizational dynamics curriculum. We're coming to the end of our second year teaching that program there, and uh, we take a lot of the um, uh, value from that course, from the practical things that we learn from people like you in the business who are trying to implement and use agile in meaningful ways in your organization. So uh, a lot of what we learn in this place ends up in our classroom as well. So if, again, if you would ever like to uh, come along to our classroom, be a guest speaker, or just to sit in on some of the conversations and people that we bring in, we'd be happy to have you. So with that, Wayne, I will hand it over to you to introduce our speakers for today. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, again, this is our first uh, experiment at this, like Agile, where we'll make some mistakes like the registration, but we'll fix it and move forward. Um, I met Bianca McCain, I think last year, um, she was one of our reviewers for student projects, just hit it off, loved her ideas around HR and, and, and the things she's doing with clients and the belief in agile. And I said, you know, let's, let's see if we can do things together. And, uh, you know, we, we came up with a whole list of potential topics, you know, that we could talk a colloquium session. And we said, let's, you know, let's talk about agile performance management. And so we connected with uh, Bianca, she referred us to Steve Hunt, and uh, just was a kind of a great, great connection there. And so this is our first work together. I'm sure there'll be others down the road. Um, but, you know, I thought that uh, uh, SAP and, and Steve and Bianca have done some really interesting things in, in performance management in an agile way. And I thought that at least to kick off the meeting, it would be helpful if they just kind of started off. So. Bianca, Steve, very informal. You want to maybe say a few things and then do you want me to share the presentation or are you going to do the presentation, Steve? Um, I can share it. Bianca, okay. why don't you go first? Okay, yeah, great, thanks. Um, great to be here, guys. It's a fantastic topic. Wayne um, captured our relationship well. I've really enjoyed working with Wayne and the team. Um, SAP's been doing some work around Agile for many years, whether that's a process like performance management, creating more a quarterly cadence and online tools and mobile apps to uh, an actually intact group that is actually fully functioning as agile and SAP. It's just, it's, it's actually its own little organization, but they hope to expand that over the course of time. Uh, in my role as the head of customer enrichment for SAP Success Factors, which is our largest cloud business, I work with some of the biggest brands, our customers around the, the world. Um, and these are HR leaders, CHROs. They're a very interesting application for agile in the HR space. And I look forward to chatting today about that and uh, performance management specifically. Steve is literally the performance management guy. He wrote the book on performance management. So Steve, you're up. Thank you. I, I wrote a book on performance management <laughs> <laughs> on a lot more. Um, no, I wrote a book called Common Sense Talent Management, if anyone's interested. Um, but uh, no, hey. <laughs> Thanks, Bianca's my hype person. Um, so, <laughs> So um, yeah, Bianca and I have worked together for years, uh, both really people that are passionate about HR in general and using HR and HR technology to create better work environments. And my role at SAP, I've got a great title. I'm the chief expert for work in technology for the SAP Innovation Office. But what that means is um, just as easy just to explain my background. I'm an industrial organizational psychologist by training. That's what my PhD is in. But I've always focused on technology and how to use technology to shape the environments of work and the experience employees have to create more effective, more engaged, more inclusive, more adaptable, whatever organizations. And this concept of agile comes up a lot. Um, and it's interesting. I also do a lot of conversations around your company. So we want to create an agile work environment, which we'll talk a little bit about what is that. But then 
they also say, how do we create our performance management systems to support this? Because that's another part of it. And that's what Bianca and I thought we'd chat today with the conversations that we have with customers that tie to this topic and then very quickly kind of go into some breakouts and discussions. And I think um, the perspectives that we have on this are just, you know, from having worked with lots of our customers, um, I would say there is no one best way to do anything in HR. There's, but there are necessary practices that if you don't manage them, bad things happen. And we'll talk a little bit about that in Agile because we've seen things blow up. For example, like some people, Agile means we don't evaluate people anymore. And it's like, yeah, you still do. <laughs> and if you don't deal with that reality, you're going to have some issues. So uh, we'll kind of share some of the general key points that we've seen in talking with the customers, talk a little bit about how technology is enabling new ways of managing people, but then go into some breakout sessions because I think it's an interesting area here. People have not figured out how to do this. Um, and a lot of companies are wrestling and there are some fundamental dilemmas um, associated with implementing sort of agile philosophies in companies that still have limited resources. You know, we, we don't have endless amounts of money to spend on people. And how do you balance that? And it's really challenged. So um, I don't know, Bianca, should we jump into the slides? Or maybe I'd like to start, though, with before we jump into these slides, if everyone can go into the chat. Bianca and I do a lot of these roundtables, a lot of HR leaders. And one of the things we love about the chat thing is we can have you all express your views at the exact same time without talking over each other. It's very yeah. cool. If I'd had this in my family as a child, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so the first question, I guess, is given what Bianca and I, what our background is, what would people like to talk about the most here? What are, when you look at agile and performance management, what are the questions that you have when you think about, and if you think about performance management, and I'll define it a little bit, it's basically tools to align employees with the goals of the organization, provide them with coaching support to make them successful, but then to make decisions about them based on their relative contributions to the company. Because it's those three things. Pay is part of performance management, for example. So is staffing. So how... What, given that, what would you? What are the questions? The big questions that the group has around agile. Just go ahead and type stuff in, and we will take a look at it. Making the process. Mm -hmm. As they come in, Steve, I can kind of read them. Let's see. So making performance management more of a two-way process rather than a one-way um, conversation, shifting an organization's agile mindset from personal metric focus to organizational outcomes. Yeah, that's a challenging one. How do you leverage agile principles to provide better and more frequent feedback to employees? Questions of pay for performance. Yes, many questions there. Uh, how, does, how does agile evaluation look, look like? This is like the heart of the matter, isn't it? Um, giving mm -hmm. good... Forward. I love feed forward. It's a great concept. Um, not looking in the rear view. Very important. Uh, my questions would be one in a more volatile work environment where agile is great to help teams flex. How do you provide employees with trust that performance management will be fair? Love that. That's even taking that one evaluative piece, one step you know, more granular. How to tie with compensation if scope of work and impact has changed so much. Coordination and alignment around team outcomes. Yep. Change management practices and adoption of agile performance. Applying best practices from agile with the more traditional, like federal government. Yep. Performance management framework. I don't know if you, they ever get there, to be honest. That's a good question. Um, you, ment you mentioned their relative contributions. Is that on an individual level uh, in agile, we try to drive team collaboration and performance over individual. More a statement than a question. Thank you, Miles. Mm -hmm. That is true. Uh, ways to approach shifting middle management from command and control to more coaches, how to address their fear. I just had a discussion of, with a mining company last week about that exact thing, if you can imagine that sector. Yep. Great. So, Steve, you got it all? You know, yeah, these are, well, these are really good questions. So, Bianca and I have a couple slides prepared that we kind of will, will frame the conversation and then we'll break into different groups. But I thought one of the things, I think you, you called it out of a, 
Bianca, it's probably the hardest dilemma is the evaluation one, agile evaluation, and how do we evaluate people? And including like teams, that's the classic thing. And I think I will express my view as a psychologist, a team is a collection of individuals. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, team performance depends on behaviors of individuals. Now, granted, how you're going to evaluate people when they're working in teams is different than if they're working as individuals. But it is impossible to evaluate. It's impossible to improve the performance of a team if you don't improve the be, change the behaviors of the individuals on that team. <laughs> so, team fundamentally, team performance is fundamentally about effectively managing individual performance in a team context. That's my perspective. I just share that because I've actually talked to people that think there's some sort of magical team synergy that exists by itself that you cannot measure. I don't personally believe that, but you know, I'm a mathematician, so maybe that's why I think that way. Um, so, should we go into the slides? Yes, these are really yes. good questions. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, I'll have the questions down so we don't forget. Yeah, and we'll come back to that. So, you will notice as we get into this that Bianca and I are really passionate about this, but we kind of also have a somewhat cynical sense of humor sometimes because if you work in HR and technology as long as we have, you can't survive without a sense of humor. Um, so I love this cartoon about the agile management. It's like we didn't have a strategy. We kept changing our minds. We failed repeatedly. Let's just say we're being agile. There is a certain element of truth to this. I've seen it sometimes. Um, a lot of people in companies, and I want to be really clear too, in the world of technology, there is agile software development methodology, which is a highly prescriptive way of running. It's kind of like total quality management. It's like the highly prescriptive set of series and philosophies and methods and techniques. That is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the concept of how can we implement a, a solution that gets away from the traditional command and control will tell you what to do. You do it prescriptive form of performance management to one that is more flexible, organic, encourages more collaboration and shifting of roles, which is a lot of the agile concepts underlying it. But we're not talking about the, the strict agile software development methodology. Um, <clears throat> and I think when you look at this idea of saying, okay, agile is really, we want to create more of a organic flow, more dynamic teams, more shifting, more frequent feedback, stronger growth mindset. How do you do that at the same time, control headcount costs, deal with the fact that never, not everyone contributes at the same level, that there really are differences in performance and they really do have an impact on an organization. And this gets into the fundamental dilemma, dilemma of performance management overall, which is on the left-hand side, you've got creating learning cultures, which is, you know, if you want a high performing organization, you need to create a learning culture. You know, it's about individual potential, focusing on ongoing coaching, you know, it incorporates a lot of agile team techniques and the methodologies, the stand up meetings, all the other things that use in agile. And it fundamentally is based on the belief that past behavior of people does not limit their future behavior, that people can always grow and do new things, which is true to a point. Then you've got the other side of optimizing organizational performance, which is optimizing team performance, which I remember somebody once told me what's the most important thing for creating an effective team, getting the right people on the team to begin with. <laughs> you know, everything else will come out of that and then getting them in the right roles. And that does require comparing people and it does require recognizing that not everyone does this, can do the same things or some things are easier for others. And um, it may involve people being moved on and off of teams, uh, you know, sometimes, and, and it assumes at a fundamental level, you know, what's the best predictor of future performance It's past performance. Now, granted within certain contexts, but you kind of see this dilemma here. And it's funny too, because on the one on the right, one of the things that really is overlooked and Bianca and I lived right through the whole get rid of ratings thing in performance management, which didn't work as one customer said, first of all, you can eliminate formal ratings, but you can't eliminate people judging each other. That's something that has to happen in organizations. They also didn't really recognize that one of the things that is most frustrating for high performing people is working with low performing people. 
not bad people that were trying to get into the organization, but how many people like being on teams where one of the team members just isn't doing what they're supposed to do? That is a real significant issue, particularly for retention of very committed, high-performing people. So there's like this whole element that has to get managed, but it's hard. So I will pause, Bianca, do you want to add some color commentary? Yeah, I think I'm just to add to this, Steve. I was thinking about some examples of organizations that do agile really well and holding it up against some of the criteria here. And one of the organizations that's, you know, very specific, small, they were a startup, you know, high growth is a company like Spotify. Do folks know the Spotify agile approach? It's very, it's very famous. And if you think about what they did, they really doubled down on this learning culture, right? The entire agile model at Spotify is built around agile coaching, retrospectives, sharing your challenges and having a mental mindset that you can say, I, I kind of messed up, I need some help. And that's actually hard to get right in more traditional organization that didn't start there, right? They started with a 30 person uh, team and they used the scrum model and they grew it and applied it across the organization in guilds and tribes and chapters and all these different things. And that's a famous one, but um, the learning culture I think can't be overlooked. Even here at SAP, we are trying this. I'd say about 10 years ago at SAP, we started putting in new values around staying curious and um, building bridges, not silos and tell it like it is. And these are the, this is the language that we use. It has set the foundation, took a lot of years to be able to start creating this learning culture, um, just even the opening for that. Yeah, and I think what Bianca, you're hitting on that too, a lot of these things that create agile learning cultures are actually changing how we evaluate individual performance. So, yeah. The, you know, Microsoft is a really great example. There's their famous thing. We used to be a culture of know-it-alls and now we're a culture of learn-it-alls, but they've defined very specifically that we used to evaluate leaders on one thing and now we evaluate them on something else that is more in keeping with this agile sort of mindset. So I, I think it's what's important is saying that agile does not mean we don't evaluate individual performance. The challenge is how can we evaluate individual performance in an effective way? And going back to this has ripple effects because the effectiveness of a team is about the performance of the individuals, but performing in a certain way. Um, and that's really hard. And the bigger the organization is, the harder it is. Because if you look at like the most agile companies tend to be small entrepreneurial companies where everyone knows everyone else. And if there's somebody that isn't kind of contributing, it's sort of known and there's a lot of social pressure, but when you become a very, very large organization, it becomes much harder to have that sort of agile thing. And it's interesting, a friend of mine is an IO psychologist in Amazon, and that's all he does. Their whole team is obsessive about how can we keep this day one mentality at Amazon. I know there's different perspectives about Amazon's talent management practices, but they are really fascinating as a company. They are obsessive about how do we not lose that constantly changing kind of agile mindset. So it's really sort of interesting. Um, so how do companies do this? And I say there isn't one best way, but the thing that we've learned is we've talked to lots of companies out there that are looking to transform their performance management process <clears throat> is it's really this recognition that performance management isn't one thing. It's actually three separate things that have to be separate, separated to work, but they have to be linked to be effective. The first one, and these psychologically, they're very different. The first one is aligning job goals and expectations, which is about setting how, the, like the, as Bianca shared it, the, the bridge, building bridges, not silos, is a specific behavioral competency in SAP to promote more agile thinking. We're setting expectations around how we expect you to behave, but also setting goals. The challenge of this one is, I kind of joke, everyone likes to, all employees want to know what they're supposed to do, but no one wants to be told what to do. <laughs> you know? And so how do you get better at setting goals? And the big change that has happened in this area is companies have gone away from annual cascaded goals. They still make cascade goals, but they don't do it as this big annual process. What they do is they focus more on ongoing role clarification. And there's this whole thing to continuous performance management was how can we make sure managers and employees, and by manager, I mean the people that are responsible for justifying the headcount dollars of that individual, which is kind of a brutal way of putting it, but it's like, you know, people are an investment. 
the person who's responsible for making sure the company is getting the ROI of the money they spend on a certain team, having regular discussions with employees about what is it that matters and what are you focusing on and is it the right thing and continuously checking in about expectations, knowing that they're going to change. That's one of the big changes that's going on. Um, I'll go through the the other two really quickly and then Bianca get, get you know, chime in. For example here with Steve and Ryan. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh no, go ahead, Bianca. Are sure? Yeah, okay. yeah. I'm tired of hearing myself talk. Yeah, I never get <laughs> hearing Dr. Hunt. Oh, really yes, you do. <laughs> You're a customer of ours out of APJ is a company called Woolworths, which I know is not very popular here in the US, but is actually very, very uh, significant and popular uh, out, out in the Australia space. Do you guys know about the method and the Woolworths example already? About what they do there? So Woolworths is a large grocery chain. They actually have a lot more even than that. They have bars and hotels and all this very interesting um, customer serving business. And they, several years ago, began something called Woolies X. And they, what they wanted to do was to compete with companies like, they have a large grocery chain out there called Kohl's, also a customer of ours. They wanted to compete directly with the Kohl's and the Amazons of the world for online digital business, because at the time, Woolworths was only about 3% having digital um, commerce. And so that, that was obviously not keeping pace with Kohl's, who was like a 25%, right? So what they did is they, they're a 94-year-old company, by the way. So this is a very large, huge employer, hundreds of thousands of people, very old and highly competitive. And they actually brought three different divisions together to base the so digital team, the e-commerce team, and um, you know the store, store the, the brick and mortar store teams to get the experience part right. They brought them all together to think about driving personalized, innovative, innovative digital experience for customers. And they actually, what's interesting here is they they actually set this up as a P&L, its own separate business. So it wasn't something someone did on the side or like they got voluntold or people signed on to be part of this business to come together in new ways. And they became very successful. So now there's actually a head of Agile, of Woolies X that does this. And they are much more competitive against Kohl's today. I think the numbers are like 50% of their customers goes to the e-commerce site now within four days. They even may show up at a store. So they're, they're tracking a lot of the metrics around performance. And it's been phenomenal growth. So yeah. in Walmart's example, that really, I think, Steve, speaks to all three of these pieces. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think one of the things that you hit on, too, Bianca, is that what you're seeing in companies too is how you do ongoing goal clarification. Companies are realizing it's not the same across the whole organization. So like in the Woolworths example, they set this up for their e-commerce. They didn't implement that in their grocery store for frontline employees. It's a different kind of job. And so that doesn't mean you can get some agile concepts in a you know frontline grocery store job, but you do it in a very different way. And so I think this idea of one thinking about how are we going to do this aligning job goals and expectations? And, I'll, and we'll talk in a minute, just very briefly about technology's role in this, but because um, technology is making it possible for companies to implement multiple kinds of performance management within one organization, which is different from in the past. The, the second part of this is the Psychologically, so you start with goals and expectations, and that's about motivation. When you show up at work, what are you thinking about? I got to get done. The second one is about awareness and feedback. How do we learn? How do we get feedback that's very developmental in nature about how can I be successful at you know meeting these expectations? And here, this is the thing where companies probably struggle the most because there's definitely a right and a wrong way to give feedback. Um, a lot of managers did not grow up in feedback rich cultures, so they don't have good role models on how to do it. Uh, it's not that they don't want to do it, but, um, so companies are investing a lot in teaching managers, but also I think what's really interesting, teaching employees how to receive feedback, because that's a really interesting issue. So like an example, um, this is a SAP customer, one of our, but, uh, is Facebook, one of the things that, I don't know if they still do it, but for a while what they used to do is when employees were onboarded, they part of the onboarding for employees was teaching them how to ask for and receive feedback. Mm-hmm. And, and the expectation that your manager would provide you with feedback. 
Also, there's really interesting things happen here around social communities where you look to create some communities where people can kind of interact more and get ideas and tips from each other. Um, but this is about awareness and feedback. The th now, the interesting thing is that this one doesn't work if you don't have clear goals because uh, feedback without goals is just telling people to do stuff. <laughs> you know, I kind of like the example of. So the, and then the third one, though, when this is crossing into the most difficult area, leaves the kind of coaching learning side and goes to the other side of running a company, which is people are really expensive. We need to maximize the ROI of talent. We need to recognize high impact people. It's not about getting people out of the organization because companies tend to have different processes if somebody's counterproductive, but it's about how do we sort of optimize the workforce? And we did a really interesting study on this one where we found that companies that were trying to implement more agile coaching-based performance management methods, the ones that were the most successful were the ones that were completely transparent about, yes, we do evaluate you. There was nothing about we've gotten rid of ratings or we don't evaluate. It was like, Yes, we do evaluate you. This is how we do it. This is the data that we look at. These are the people that are involved. And they really invest heavily, though, in making sure that those, convers those evaluations aren't done with a manager in an annual rating form. They're done through really rich conversations about talent. And it's really interesting because... If you don't have transparency on this, people approach goal setting and feedback much differently. Because people, as one person put it, they said, look, it's stressful to be evaluated, but you know what is more stressful? Knowing someone's evaluating you and not knowing how, how they're doing it or what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. And so the, the big change here that isn't talked about because it's not popular to talk about evaluation, you know, it's popular to talk about coaching and learning organizations is if you scratch the surface of the companies that have what we call sort of agile cultures, most of them really do have pretty good methods where they really talk a lot about the talent they have in the organization in a comparative way, but they do it with a very forward focused mindset about moving people into the right roles and they really think about it a lot. They don't pretend that side doesn't exist, but I'll say that side's really hard. So the last thing, and the last thing just to cover and then we'll sort of break into groups is how is technology affecting this? I mean, what technology is doing is it's taking off the constraints that we had before and allowing companies to try a lot of different things. So like continuous performance management applications, which I call them like Apple watches for goal setting and coaching conversations. They remind managers to set goals. They keep track of the class goal conversations they have. And they make it easier for employees to trigger these conversations. That's, you know, that's really having a really big impact. Much better tools for employee listening where employees can give feedback to each other, to the company, to managers about how they're feeling, what's going on. Um, <clears throat> these are sometimes also called employee experience systems. Um, work experience platforms, which are ways to bring employees together, regardless of their formal role, to say, hey, we're all working on the same topics and the same ideas and information communities and places to share that, as well as places to find opportunities. Hey, we need somebody for our team who's got this capability. Would you be able to do this? So there's some really interesting things that are allowing you to connect people. And then the last one, talent management suites that are really designed to help companies have more forward-looking, constructive conversations about employees. My, as one customer put it, which I really like, she said, you know, the technology has allowed us to reduce the time used to, people used to spend on filling out forms and reinvest that time into having conversations about the information that was on those forms, okay. you know, and tying things like continuous performance management data into these talent management suites. So that's... um kind of the state of where we're at. So Bianca, do you have any last comments before we break into our breakouts? Well, I think the only thing I'll say here, Steve, is that, you know, if you think about agile at the core, you know, what is it? It's basically taking, you know, small chunks of work and then delivering that small chunk of work and then iterating, right? I think technology supports us in working on that rhythm a little bit better, like CPM. Actually, today I have all my SAP talks today and tomorrow with my team. So go figure. 
that's our agile method here. And um, I think that's really important. It's all types of work. We think about evaluation. It's 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 evaluating the milestone achieved by the group, not some huge, massive, 12 month long progressive goal to change our mindset about what success looks like in that iterative moment. And these tools actually really help us to do that. Yeah, I think building what you said, it's these small chunks and it takes things like if you work on a project in January, because some things are always going to be annually based. As long as we're on annual financial calendars, things like compensation are always probably going to have an annual component to them. But how can we make sure that that thing that has to be annual, because that's just the way the world is, can be tied to things that are more agile and moving and things like the continuous performance manage management application so that when a company does have to sit down and make sort of a formal evaluation of its investments in headcount, employees can get credit for that agile team I was on nine months ago that no one remembers, but it did really cool stuff. And it allows to take these things and kind of move them in, as well as also the, the work experience platforms Agile is empowering employees more to make decisions about where they can add the most value. And that's an interesting one because work experience platforms are definitely allowing employees to find different teams and do internal staffing that's not done through the formal command and control structure. It does raise some interesting issues around managers, one, freeing up their best performing employees to work for other teams, but also not, that hurt, not hurting the manager themselves because it's like, well, if they're working for someone else, they're not working for me. Um, and my team has stuff it has to do too. So it's like the technology is allowing us to sort of take these small things and bring it together, but it's very much in flux. So um, any questions from anyone in the audience? We, we, and we wanted to get into like breakout sessions, but um, questions, thoughts, reactions? Tatiana has a great comment in chat. Tatiana, are you brave enough to come off uh, mute? You want to read it? Want me to read it? Sure. No, I can talk. I just um, can't That's do it. I look a little sickly, but I hopefully I sound not sickly. Not great. So I come from a very large organization. I work for Unilever. And I think a part of the issue here is that what, what resourcing allocations conversations look like is a massive monster. And what business expectations and priorities look like depends on which leader you really ask because you have divisional priorities. Like you have to cut that elephant in, in some ways uh, to make decisions. So I really struggle to visualize how do you align what performance expectations are and who is making resourcing allocation decisions based on that when you're dealing with such a complicated, large system. So I think uh, some good examples or challenges in that space would be good to hear. Yeah, that really, I think um, that's interesting because that's exactly sort of the, uh, the the third thing in our breakout session. So Tatiana, because I, I think what we wanted to do is to kind of dive into conversations and go in those different areas. And to that point, I don't, I have examples of companies that are doing that in general, where they're doing things like Bianca said, where the continuous performance management technology, which keeps tracks to sort of the different goals that you may work on over the year, when people are being evaluated in those larger annual processes that they are not directly involved in a lot, it allows companies to feed data into that. The best way to do that though, I, I think I've had lots of conversations with companies that are trying to figure it out. It's probably the hardest thing I think about Agile is reconciling the desire to give freedom and flexibility to employees to focus on small things that can have the most value with the need to control workforce costs. I quick comment on that before we break up into the, yeah. the I think that's key. The, the reality is if you are a manager right now with an intact team, you know the full performance of the individual on your team. Maybe you don't know every single you know, micro knit about their performance, but you know what they're signed up to do, you're managing their performance and you know if they've done it. In this agile model, you have to actually trust that the assessment that someone else gave you gave this person is it an accurate depiction of their work, right? So in the technology CPM model, continuous performance management, someone can log, Bianca was two stars here, five stars here, terrible job here, and or great. And, and the manager, has, if there's one intact manager still, if the, if the agile process hasn't actually created teams that never have the same manager, then they have to trust that. That's where technology can help, but there's that mindset shift. And then on the other end, two examples here, you've got like a company like Intel that has a gig pool 
of people that their full-time job is to be loaned out to projects based on their skills. That's an interesting approach. Then you've got folks like SAP, we have fellowships. This is the burden on the employee. So I have an employee on a fellowship right now. I try to make space in her day on my team to go do that. But really she's taking on an extra capacity project in another part of the organization. You got the org burden in the Intel model, right? You're taking resources out of the pool, out of the orgs and making them general resources. And then you've got the employee burden in the fellowship model. They're gonna have to figure this out. So anyway, that's a, just a quick comment there, but yeah. I wanna get into breakouts. I'm excited about this. Yeah, I think I've actually, the other side look at Tatiana is professional services firms. Professional services firms actually do this a lot, but they also have the benefit of having something called billable hours <laughs> that allows them to sort of evaluate, you know, performance of people on financial sites. But um, they really think a lot about what they don't, they don't have to call it agile, but what they do is very sensitive agile of people constantly moving to different teams and different groups. Okay, so yeah, we did want to break into this. So our thought was we do three groups. I don't know if Wayne, if you've already well, we, broken actually, them out. We have... Uh... I created, I didn't want to groups four or five people. So we actually have five groups. I okay. mean, there may be too many, but, and I think given the time, um, each group just pick one question that you're comfortable with. I'm not sure they're going to have time. If you have time for more than one, that's fine. But let's take about 10 minutes and then we'll, we'll come back. You probably can't, can't go through each person. So maybe we'll ask one person to be kind of a transcriber and maybe put some of your comments in the chat room so we can collect the knowledge and use that. Everyone, I know, um, am I still on? No. We uh, obviously want to keep uh, on our timetable on. We lost five minutes at the beginning. So if if the one person each team can maybe write some of your comments in the chat room, we can start doing that. We're going to actually call in some people. and But uh, we want to just capture everything. Because again, the whole pur pur purpose of this is to aggregate information that we can develop some open source insights and practice for others. So if, if one person from each team can start doing that, um, just a reminder, our next session will be uh, on May 11th. It may be the exact same format, may be different. We'll have to see. We're learning from this. Again, it's our first time. Uh, and Melanie Penna, who's Senior Vice President of HR at Comcast, is going to be doing a similar role to Bianca and Steve. She's going to talk about you've been put in charge of a transformation project. Now what? So how do you, from a leadership perspective, how do you manage all that? Again, these are things we've seen come up in our conversations that we felt is helpful to develop our ecosystem to develop some insights. Okay. Um, team number one, anybody want to um, just can you give us a verbal overview? I'll speak up. So our group kind of talked about how we all of our organizations that we're currently with are kind of in a antiquated performance management once a year loop and the challenge of change that would come with moving to more agile performance management system and getting executive buy-in and the desire to, you know, a lot of executives want change, but they want it quickly and how time consuming a change like this would take. Okay, cool. I think they call we, yeah, so we we'll, I'll talk from group one. I think we, um, we had a great discussion around the easy topics like, uh, you know, team composition, moving in and out of teams. Uh, is it stable teams or whatever? Um, so that could that was that was a very interesting discussion. You know, do you get allocated to a team uh, as a stable team, or do you uh, you know move in and out? And then we also spoke, I think, about um, you know the. Agile is not for every single area that part of, of, the, of the business. You need to make sure that you're using the right part of the agile principles and not and I talk about mindset and 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 um, and thought process rather than methodologies uh, for various parts of the business. So don't just try to take something like scaled agile and slam it into an HR department. It's not necessarily going to work. Well it's it's actually not going to work. So one of the things that I would I would just kind of mention is um, you know, we we talked a lot about um, kind of uh, how do you give kind of performance reviews when people don't really report up into you and and how do you really work in a more effective uh, matrix organization um, and we talked about um, kind of that 360 and getting getting feedback from everyone. Um, and, and it also what I think um, I'll add is kind of driving networking and driving relationships. So that's really where you get the benefits of an agile kind of mindset shift. 
Yeah, when if I if I may come in, yes. we also really yes. spoke. Yes. Yeah, I, I think you know, in our group, yeah, I shared an example. I think that's what uh, Priyanka is referring to. Like you know, when you compare to implementing agile in like a product uh, environment versus like an HR environment, where your priorities keeps shifting, uh, you know, unlike like a product delivery. the importance of uh, role clarity and goal clarity and a system can i think what i was saying is uh, i i was in our group i had shared an example of how the difference of implementing agile in like hr because if you look at a product environment where there is a product launch but like in hr or in some other functions where you're constantly shifting goal posts it's very difficult to implement a agile implementation so to me instead of the end uh, outcome there is a we need to find a way to measure and evaluate progress yeah, you know which is what like bianca summarized very nicely we had a, we had a chat around the um the the challenges of of managers in the role of giving effective feedback and how how they're often challenged and struggling to do that and often are ill prepared when they're promoted to manager to give good feedback so we really attacked it at a deeper cultural level how do you make it a a, a real deep um requirement and that while somebody's in the in the process of being developed as a manager they're given these opportunities to to do this and it becomes ingrained into the values of the organization and it's more than just a training exercise is what i think Kathy said it has to be far more than just training it's got to be something really central to the organization and and built into the culture Kathy you know I guess Wayne as we're closing up I want to call some of it Catherine Clater shared which I thought was a really good point was yeah. transparency the more transparency you can have around every goal the goals people are working on just how that ties in sort of drives everything forward mm-hmm. so that you know that cultural to our managers is it, if a manager is not good at coaching how does it affect their career mm-hmm. um, if mm-hmm. at all so i thought that was a really good observation Catherine. Sure, so i i was just going to piggyback on um, the point that steve hart made which is you know the manager is central to the to the conversation and our group discussed you know how is the manager incented as the manager only incented on you know financial goals um and and you know um if that's the case then agile may not be successful you know in terms of performance if that's the only you know incentive the manager has so further squeeze there again uh, this was our first session i think things went well we things we have to tweak the whole idea really is just conversations we found that when we have conversations the interaction generates some insights that are useful to all of us and so steve and i and and steve and bianca going to look through the tape and and focus on things and uh, you know we'll see where this takes us so again thank you very much thanks to steve hart Bianca, Steve. Hunt. Thank you. Thanks Wayne and Steve for all giving us the opportunity and everyone to chat with and hopefully we can have for few further conversations on this. Look forward to connecting yeah. on LinkedIn if you if you want to do that to keep the conversation going. It was great to see you and hope to see you on uh, our next one in May.